Well, hello, my friends. How's it going? Welcome to D4. D and D deep dive. Four Ds. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons and Dragons. We theory craft about them. We crunch numbers about them. Not with the intent for me to tell you the best or the right way to play a character in game, but to explore one potential way to build and play a character with the hopes of creating something that is both really fun to play and also really powerful. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on a character that you're thinking about building and playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for being here. My name's Colby. And you are? Really quick, if you would be interested in getting a cheat sheet written step-by-step -step guide on how to recreate this character and any of the other characters that I build on this channel so that you don't have to like go back and rewatch the video or take notes, but just kind of follow that guide, then I would hope you would consider joining the channel as a member. There should be a little button down there that says join. If you click on it for $2 a month, you can get access to that cheat sheet right up. And also it's a nice way to support the channel and help me create more and better content. So big shout out and thank you to my channel members and for everybody else. You guys are also awesome. Thank you for being here, watching, subscribing, liking, commenting. Those are all also ways to support me. And so I'm grateful to you for doing those things. Thank you. All right. I've had a lot of requests over the years to do an Oathbreaker Paladin. And with one exception, and that's where they were part of a two character team up build that I did, uh, the Necromancer and the Oathbreaker. I've never so much as dipped into Oathbreaker before. Despite the fact that the subclass is incredibly strong, among the strongest, I would argue, as we will see. In fact, I would even argue that they are the best sustained damage character in all of paladin dumb <laughs> in D&D 5e currently. And there's really one main reason for me shying away from Oathbreakers to date. And it's really in this little bit right here that we read from Wizards of the Coast in their description of the Oathbreaker. A paladin must be evil to become an Oathbreaker. I think this might be, correct me if I'm wrong, the only instance where the game itself dictates to us what our alignment must be in order to play a certain subclass. Does the Death Cleric? Let's look. No? No, not even the Death Cleric. Even like the old school 5e races that tended toward evil usually just said that a race was usually evil, right? Not that a player must be evil in order to take that race. And the thing is, I'm like the type of person who has a really hard time playing a bad guy in like any RPG, even video game role-playing games, a la Bioware stuff, right? Where you're always given dialogue options and there's always like the good guy dialogue option and like the bad guy dialogue option and then maybe sometimes the funny guy dialogue option. And by guy, I mean girl, because we all know that Shepard is female. Anyway, I have to seriously like force my hand to click that bad guy choice when I make it every single time. And even then, it's only after I've gone through and played the game to completion already once through so I can tell myself, it's okay, man. This isn't how it really happened. I just want to see what would have happened if Shepard would have punched that reporter in the face. I'm not really a renegade. Revan was a good Jedi, right? So how in the world am I going to play an actual evil character for an entire D&D &D campaign? I just don't know if I could do it. But guess what? There's good news in that we're playing D&D &D here, not a video game, right? So as long as your DM approves, you can kinda do whatever the heck you want. Sure, the book says you have to be evil, but maybe, just maybe, you can convince your DM that I don't know, maybe you were initially a follower, whether like a cleric or some sort of like evil knight pseudo paladin of like Lolth or Bane or Tiamat. But now you have seen the light. You broke your oath to that evil god and have vowed to never serve that god in their evil ways again. It might make things a little bit awkward as an oathbreaker to have all of these abilities to like control and buff undead. But you might reflavor that as something other than undead or even hand wave it and say, hey, some of these powers just kind of stuck around, even though I'm a good guy now. A la other famous anti-heroes like the Crow or Casey Jones or the Punisher or insert your favorite, I'm not really a bad guy, I'm just misunderstood character here. I mean, 
Heck, even Jeremy Crawford himself gives you a stamp of approval right here if that's what you're into. Check out this Twitter thread from 2020 if it helps you sleep better at night. That said, I mean, maybe it's okay to just play an evil character once in a while. It is a role-playing game after all, right? If we're just playing a slightly modified version of ourselves time and time again with every character we make, then we're not really stretching or flexing our role-playing muscles very much, are we? And although I've never played an evil character in-game to date myself, I have tried playing characters who are, you know, a little outside my comfort zone in the form of other races, even genders, and every time I do, I really enjoy getting into the character and like forcing myself to try to think and act not just as a slightly different version of myself, but maybe as someone who's like another step or two removed from kind of my own persona and personality. It really elevates the level of fun that I have at the table. And when your whole party can do the same, I think the quality of play and role play especially just kind of goes to a whole nother level at the table. So you know what? Let's go for it. Let's just build a quintessential traditional evil oathbreaker. You certainly wouldn't have to for yours, of course, but I'm gonna force myself to stretch a little bit here. Now, it goes without saying, I think, if you are, but I'm gonna say it anyway, so that's a strange phrase. If you are going to play an evil character in game, you should definitely discuss it with your DM and fellow players first to make sure that everyone's okay with it and, you know, figure out how you would actually fit into the party if everybody else is like neutral or good alignment, right? And of course, there's no reason why just because you start off as an evil character, you couldn't become redeemed at some point, right? Nothing like a good old fashioned redemption arc to give you some seriously emotionally satisfying character development to dive into. And finally, here's the thing about Oathbreakers. Like I said, I think they're probably the best paladin subclass in the game for sustained damage. And you guys know how much I love sustained damage builds. And so since they are a paladin, that means they're also sort of just naturally good at almost everything else in the game that you want them to be good at. Survivability, check. Burst damage, check. Support capabilities, check, check. So let's build them with an eye towards sustained damage here. But I think my kind of overarching goal with this character is going to be to create a really strong jack of all trades. I wanna be good at everything. Though we'll compare them to other sustained DPR characters when I crunch the numbers just to see how we measure up. And so I am proud to present episode 111, the Oathbreaker. Huge thanks to my good friend Randall Hampton who created this fantastically amazing artwork for the character concept that I sent him for the character this week. He does this every week. He's amazing. And if you guys want to follow him on social media or even potentially reach out to him to see if you could commission him to create some artwork for your character or even your entire party, I will, as always, put links in the video description on how to do so. Thanks, Randall. Before we jump into the build, I've got to tell you guys about a new sponsor for the video this week that I am super excited about. It's Alchemy RPG, and they're soon to be published 5e compatible science fantasy campaign, Lore of Athera, Dark Symmetry. This campaign is in the very final days of their Kickstarter. At the time of this recording, they've already blown past their initial funding goal by over eight times, but at the time of release, there's only a couple of days left. The Kickstarter ends October 6th, so do not delay backing these guys if you think it looks as amazing as I do, and let me tell you why I think it looks amazing. Dark Symmetry is the second installment in the Lore of Athera saga, the first of which you guys might have already heard of. It's called The Lost Druid. Dark Symmetry is dedicated to exploring exploring the underwater city of Chrysalia and its technological mystery. It's a 300 plus page campaign setting and adventure. It takes you all the way up to character level 10, and you can either pick up the story right from the beginning of this book, or if you've played the first part, The Lost Druid, you can continue the saga here. Speaking of, if you missed The Lost Druid, but you wanna check it out, if you back this project at a variety of higher tier levels, you can pick up both The Lost Druid and Dark Symmetry in either a standard or limited edition form. Together, these two books form just the first half of a grander overarching epic saga. This world that Alchemy RPG has created looks and feels absolutely gorgeous and intriguing. You know, if you enjoy mixing a little science with your fantasy, or, or if you just think that exploring 
and helping to save an extensive and thriving underwater city at your D&D table sounds fun, you really ought to check out Dark Symmetry. And they even add a really cool crafting system that they build right into the campaign. It's called Aethercraft, where you can tap into the alchemical and magical qualities of the world around you to create and even improve new and unique magic items whose power and function are really only limited by your imagination. Again, there's only a couple of days left to back this project, so make sure you go to the link that I'm putting in the video description to check them out, and I'd appreciate it if you'd use that link because that's how they know I sent you. But take advantage of all of the really great goodies that they are giving away to Kickstarter backers like deluxe editions, dice sets, posters, even vinyl records of the accompanying soundtrack, and much, much more. Huge thanks to Alchemy RPG. Congrats on yet another successful Kickstarter Starter. This product looks amazing. Can't wait to see the finished version. And let's jump into the build. All right, at level one for our starting class, yes, we're going to start with Paladin, if you can believe it. Now, my image of this character actually has them starting out with like the best of intentions. There might be a darker side to them, but if so, it's one that, for the moment at least, they're trying to suppress or overcome. They're trying to be good, but it's so hard. <laughs> I do think that they would be dealing perhaps with some sort of trauma in their past and their backstory that they're trying to put behind them. It could be as simple as like a tragic death of a loved one to a villain wiping out their entire village or to something even more existential, like struggling against the feeling that nothing they do seems to really make a difference in the world. And the only thing that makes right is might. Regardless, at this point they have come to see becoming a paladin as a way to help them overcome whatever darkness is inside them that they're wrestling with. Now, as for our race, there is a very important feat that I want on this character, and I really want to start off with it at level one, so I'm gonna go custom lineage, which will let us take a nice half feat later on and still get our ability score to 18 at that point, which makes me happy. As for the free feat that we get to start off with as a custom lineage character, I'm going to take Polar Master, but don't worry, I'm not doing what you think I'm doing. You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. As a reminder, with Polar Master, we get a slew of nice benefits. First off, when we use the right kind of weapon, polearms like halberds, but also including spears and quarterstaffs, we can make an opportunity attack with them when an enemy leaves or enters our reach, which can be very nice. Second, if we take the attack action with the aforementioned right kind of weapon, sans the pike, then as a bonus action, we can make another attack with the butt of the weapon, the blunt end, right? Which we affectionately refer to as our butt action. That attack only does a d4 of bludgeoning damage as opposed to hitting him with the pointy end, but we otherwise get to take advantage of whatever benefits we might have been getting by attacking with that specific weapon. And that's what makes this especially wonderful. So right at level one, we've got a nice weaponized bonus action attack, and that's kind of fantastic. As for our abilities, I assume that we're going the point by method as always and recommend taking a 15 strength, a 15 charisma and taking our plus two from custom lineage there, and a 14 constitution. We need at least a 13 strength when multi-classing with Paladin, and I figure we might as well go 15 so that we don't have any move speed penalties while wearing the best heavy armor in-game, which we plan on doing eventually. As for our equipment, nothing super special here. I'd just take some chainmail, a shield, and then a spear or quarterstaff. And again, I'll explain why later. But obviously, we're partly doing this so that we can get our butt action right with the polearm master feet. As a paladin, at level one, then, we get divine sense, first of all, which tells us that charisma modifier times per day, and with our action, we can detect any undead fiends or fey within 60 feet of us, not behind total cover. That will be useful once in a great while. But then we also get the very nice Lay on Hands feature, which tells us that we get five Lay on Hands points per level of Paladin we have. These reset on a long rest, and then with an action we can use them to heal a number of hit points equal to the Lay on Hands points we spend with a touch, or by spending five points we can cure a poison or disease. This is a really great support feature that all Paladins get access to, and it scales really nicely as well. At level two, we get a fighting style, and I'm going to commit to using a one-handed weapon and a shield on this character throughout their career. Personally, I would plan on going with a spear, 
and I absolutely love the image of a shield and spear user, honestly. Maybe I just watched 300 too many times. Or more accurately and nerdily, I loved doing hoplite rushes, playing as the Greeks in every single version of Civilization to date. So with the dueling fighting style, we get to add two damage to attacks that we make with a melee weapon when we're holding it in one hand and no other weapons. And yes, that will even apply to our butt action that we make with that weapon, thanks to the polar master feat, and that's really nice. Also, as a paladin at level two, we get Divine Smite. You know it, you love it. When we hit with a melee weapon attack, we can choose to spend a spell slot to do extra radiant damage on that attack. It's 2d8 for a first level spell slot, and then it goes up by another 1d8 for each additional spell slot that we spend, capping at 5d8 or fourth level spell slots. We also get to add another d8 of damage if we're attacking undead or fiends. Similar to the Holy Warrior build that we did, and I actually view that character as almost like the antithesis of this one in many ways, though they have a lot of similarities, of course. It's kind of a yin-yang thing we've got going with, with these two characters, but like that character, I'm not really building around this incredible feature, though I will account for it when I crunch numbers, only adding the extra smite damage when we crit. Not that you should only smite when you get a critical hit, but I figure most of us do, so long as we have the spell slot to spend, since, for now anyway, thanks 1 D&D, when we get a critical hit, we get to double all the dice that we're rolling for that attack, right? So it seems like a really decent way to try and account for this feature when we crunch numbers, but in a way that's somewhat sustainable. We also do get spells here, of course, and the two that I'd be sure to grab are fairly standard for paladins the world over, Cure Wounds for a nice little heal if you need it, and especially if you're out of Lay on Hands points, and then Bless, which is one of the best buffs in the game, letting you bless three party members, including yourself potentially, so that with your concentration and for one minute, you can add a d4 to all of your attack rolls and saving throws. And it just never gets old, this spell. I love it, you love it, everyone loves it, except the Dungeon Master. Dungeon Master probably doesn't love it. At level three, we get divine health, and that makes us immune to disease. Fantastic. But then we also get our sacred oath, and for the first time ever in any character build, when it comes to our subclass for a character, I'm gonna say, pick your favorite. <laughs> because we're gonna be breaking this oath later, right? I would say make it something super righteous, so that your fall is just that much more dramatic, right? No vengeance paladin, no, no, no. Go like devotion or redemption. Let's be like holier than thou to the nines. Now, of course, you don't have to, I believe, take another oath first necessarily before you then become an oath breaker but i think if you're gonna go oath breaker especially evil oath breaker we should for dramatic purposes if nothing else swear a different oath first so that we actually have something to break yeah again work this out with your dm of course but at level four now that we've got our goody two shoes oath in place it's time to break it and what better way to do that than with the interposition of a sinister and dastardly otherworldly patron. So yeah, at this point in our hero's story, they are approached by an otherworldly being with promises of power in exchange for their service, or pact. Why does our anti-hero want this power? For vengeance? No. That's simply the story they tell themselves in order to assuage their conscience that is small and getting smaller all of the time. I think they're in it simply for the allure of greater power. They've realized that the darkness inside them cannot be quelled with catechisms and superficial righteousness, and have instead decided to just give in to temptation and embrace the power of the dark side. Whatever your reasons, yes, we are going warlock here. And as a warlock one, we get our otherworldly patron, our warlock subclass, and you guessed it, we're going Hexblade. Hey now, calm down, I get one a quarter. Last one I did was the bard tank in June, so I'm safe. Now, we are here in Warlock for story reasons, yes. I do really love, like I say, the interposition of a Warlock level for the Oathbreaker, which is kind of the thing that instigates that breaking of the Oath. I feel like every good, bad Oathbreaker needs a solid evil influence that leads them to break their Oath, right? But of course, there are ample mechanical reasons to go Warlock as well, and especially Hexblade. Because yes, as a Hexblade, we get some fantastic features. First up, Hexblade's Curse, which tells us that once per short rest, as a bonus action, we can curse a target, and then for one minute, 
add our proficiency bonus in damage to all damage rolls we make against that target. In addition, we score a critical hit on a 19 or a 20, and if the target dies, we heal for our Warlock level plus our Charisma modifier in hit points. A very, very strong feature, perfect for taking out that most important enemy in a fight and helping us do some nice burst damage. Not something we're really focused on and building for with this character, but we will welcome it nonetheless. And then, of course, we get Hex Warrior, and this is the main reason why we wanted to go Hexblade. With Hex Warrior, we can touch a weapon that we are proficient with and make it our Hex weapon, and thereafter, when we make attacks with that weapon and that weapon only, we can use our Charisma modifier instead of our Strength modifier for our plus to hit and damage. Okay, get comfy, because we're going to be here for a minute. Yes, this is a fantastic way to let us focus from this point on on our Charisma modifier instead of our Strength modifier, and generally speaking, our character is going to benefit a lot from just being able to pump Charisma. We get support and defensive features that benefit from a higher Charisma, and Oathbreakers especially even get better damage with a higher Charisma score later on, so being able to be sad, single ability score dependent, instead of mad, multiple ability score dependent, is a really big deal for this character. The big drawback to the feature, of course, is that the weapon that we make our Hex weapon, the weapon we get to use to make our attacks with Charisma, can't have the two-handed property. Most people in the D&D community are aware of the fact that one of the best and easiest ways to get great damage as a martial melee character is to take the Polar Master feat, take the Great Weapon Master feat, equip yourself with a glaive or a halberd, and enjoy a weaponized bonus attack that, since it's using the same weapon for all attacks, even for the butt action, gets that juicy plus 10 to damage on every single attack that Great Weapon Master gives us, right? But if we wanted to do this with our Charisma score instead of our Strength score, we would have to take three levels in Warlock so that we could get to the Pact of the Blade feature because Hex Warrior says if we do that, then essentially the weapon can be two-handed. But here's the thing. I don't want to invest two more levels into Warlock. You might, in which case I'd say knock yourself out. It's just tough because if you go three levels into Warlock, then you're going to want four levels to get that ability score increase your feet so that you can grab Great Weapon Master, which is why you're doing this in the first place, and not delay it. And if you're four levels into Warlock, you're going to want to take five so that you can get essentially extra attack and even your Eldritch Smite. And suddenly, if the campaign's only going to level 10 or so, like most campaigns do, you'd be a level 8 character with only three levels in Paladin. And the campaign's almost over, and that's not really an Oathbreaker. In fact, we haven't even broken our oath yet. Now. There is, of course, an alternative if you still really wanted to use a Halberd or Glaive and get Great Weapon Master, and that's just to forego Charisma and Pump Strength. You could totally do that. It's not a terrible idea. If I were to go Strength-based for my weapon attacks on this character, I'd probably dip Barbarian instead of Warlock, like I did with the Holy Warrior, so you could benefit from Rage and Reckless Attacks. But yeah, kinda already done that. And like I said, we get a lot of benefit, especially as an Oathbreaker, with focusing on Charisma over Strength. Not only that, but I really love the spells that Warlocks, and especially Hexblade Warlocks, can get access to, even with a single level dip. It's going to increase our power to kind of help close that gap between where we're at and the Great Weapon Master feat that we're not going to use. Not only that, but like I said at the beginning, I kind of like the idea of this character being a bit of a jack of all trades, and so even though picking up Great Weapon Master, whether because we went strength or we took three levels of Warlock, would eventually get us to better sustained damage numbers, it would also mean not being able to use a shield, among other things, and that is going to mean much lower survivability, and I really really love the idea of a spear and shield character here, like I've said. Kind of like this evil hoplite. So I'm sticking to my guns and my spears. And yes, to get into it a little bit more, the reason then that we went spear, or quarterstaff alternatively, of course, is that it's kind of the best way to have both a weaponized bonus action, thanks to Polearm Master, right? But that uses the same weapon, our hex weapon, for every single attack. If we went with two weapon fighting to get a bonus action attack, not only would we not be able to use a shield, but the weapon that we were using in our offhand would have to be made with our strength score instead of charisma, since we only get one hex weapon, right? Finally, I think if we're going to be an Oathbreaker, 
Taking a warlock dip is just perfect story-wise. We're kind of selling our soul here to this otherworldly patron for the promise of greater power. Whew. Okay, we also get spells as a warlock one here, and I'm gonna say that we ought to make sure we grab the shield spell as it's unique among warlocks for hexblades. Though there is admittedly a little bit of a problem with shield, I'm definitely planning on fighting with my hands full, as I've said, and I'd really rather not have to take the warcaster feat if I can avoid it. In order to thus cast spells with material and or somatic components, such as the shield spell. At our table, you can drop your weapon as part of your reaction that you need to cast the shield spell, which again raises our armor class by five until our next turn. It's very, very strong. But if you can't do that at your table, then the shield spell isn't going to do you a ton of good without getting Warcaster first. So plan on getting to that when you can. I should probably mention then that, yeah, I'm not really planning on needing to cast a lot of spells like in the middle of combat with this character. It'll likely be casting something at the beginning of combat that uses our concentration and then just drawing your weapon and going into the fray. But aside from shield, I'd be sure to grab Eldritch Blast if you need a decent ranged attack cantrip, Armor of Agathis, which is unique to Warlocks and gives us some nice temporary hit points and even returns damage if we're hit in melee, and then, most importantly for us, the Hex spell. Hex and its less sinister counterpart, Hunter's Mark, can be decent ways to buff sustained damage, but they're not perfect. You cast Hex as a bonus action and then for one hour, which is pretty nice, and with your concentration, the enemy that you put it on has disadvantage with ability checks in an ability of your choice, and then any attacks against them do an extra 1d6 of necrotic damage on a hit. If your target dies, you can transfer the hex to a different enemy with your bonus action again, and therein lies both the blessing and the curse of the spell. If your enemies are dying after a round of combat, it's generally not worth using this spell because you'd be giving up your bonus action every round to transfer it, right? when you could be using it to do more damage. So depending on the fight, depending on the enemy, you may or may not want to use Hex. But for enemies who are surviving more than a round or two, and especially after we get extra attack later, the math often ends up making sense to use it. I'd be sure to have the spell so that I can pull it out when the time's right. But at level five, we have given in to the temptation that our otherworldly patron has offered, and as a result of either our allegiance switching or maybe our entire worldview switching, it is time to break our oath. We just can't pretend any longer. It is time to be authentic to our true dastardly selves. So yes, we're going back to Paladin so that we can do just that. We are switching our oath to Oathbreaker, and here is what we read from Wizards of the Coast on the Oathbreaker Paladin. An Oathbreaker is a paladin who breaks his or her sacred oaths to pursue some dark ambition or serve an evil power. Whatever light burned in the paladin's heart has been extinguished. Only darkness remains. Hmm. All right, pretty straightforward. So when we do swap our subclass here, we get the two channel divinity options for Oathbreakers. As a reminder, of course, we can use our channel divinity once per short rest to do three things. All paladins get Harness Divine Power, which lets us once per day, after a short rest, recover a spell slot up to half your proficiency bonus rounded up. But then also Oathbreakers get two unique uses of their channel divinity. First up, we have Control Undead, which tells us that as an action, we can force an undead to make a wisdom save, or they have to obey our commands for 24 hours. That's kind of awesome if you can find an undead to use it on. That undead must have a challenge rating lower than our paladin level, but still, you know, that would be challenge rating three for now. Challenge rating three undead monsters can be somewhat powerful. Mummies, whites, even skeletal owl bears. And yeah, it goes up by one CR for every paladin level that you gain. That scales quite nicely. Not bad at all. I hope you get to run into lots of undead. Because if not, we will likely be using the second option available much more frequently, and it's actually quite good as well. Dreadful Aspect. This lets us use our action to cause any creatures of our choice within 30 feet to make a wisdom save again, or be frightened for one minute. As a reminder, frightened creatures have disadvantage on attacks and ability checks while they can see us, and they can't willingly move closer to us. So yeah, it's a pretty great debuff and control option. Though, they do get to save again after every round, and the effect ends if they simply end their turn more than 30 feet away from us. But that means that they're both moving away, ending their turn, then probably having to dash to get back into combat, so it's likely two turns wasted there. Not bad at all. 
And yeah, this is a really juicy level for us because also at Paladin 4, of course, we get our first ability score increase or feat, and since we have a 17 charisma, I'm thinking we take Fey Touched here, one of my very favorite feats. It gives us a plus one to, for us anyway, our charisma score, putting it at a very lovely 18. And then it also lets us learn the Misty Step spell for some always super handy teleportation, which we can use once per day without spending a spell slot or thereafter using spell slots if we have them, plus one other first level spell of our choice so long as it's from the Enchantment or Divination Schools of Magic. We've already got all of the Divination or Enchantment spells that I could ever want, right? Okay, fine, take Silvery Barbs. It's an enchantment spell. It's borderline overpowered. It's really good. But you know what? You could also take Bane. And Bane is a good spell. It's kind of the anti-Bless and frankly feels a little more thematically appropriate on this character, I think, than Bless. But anyway, do what you want there. At level six, we would be a Paladin five and that means we get extra attack and we are very happy because two attacks are better than one when we take the attack action. And yes, this means that thanks to Polar Master, we can now make three attacks per turn with our spear, if you include our bonus action, butt attack. Each made with our charisma modifier, plus two damage from the dueling fighting style. As a very nice. We also get second level paladin spells here. Oathbreakers get Crown of Madness for free, which isn't a terrible control option if you want to use your concentration and your action to sort of tell your enemy that you're controlling what to do. And then, maybe intriguingly, the Darkness spell. Now, we could have taken Blind Fighting as our fighting style instead of dueling, or taken one more level in Warlock to get Devil's Sight, and thus, yes, deployed the effective, if sometimes obnoxious, I'm fighting my enemies in a bubble of darkness that I've cast around myself, and I therefore have advantage on my attacks and they have disadvantage against me, right? I've decided not to go that route for this character. Though I do think it can be an effective tactic, and it's one that I've used often for builds in the past, it even would make a lot of sense thematically, I think, for this character. So, you know, discuss it with your DM, discuss it with your other party members, maybe consider it if nobody else is doing anything at the table to get you consistent, reliable advantage. But as always, use with caution. I'm not gonna assume that we're using it when I'm crunching the numbers. Mostly, I suppose, you know, since we're not suffering that minus five penalty to hit that we would if we were using the Great Weapon Master feat. And for that reason, having advantage, having advantage isn't quite as important as it would be, though it certainly would help us a great deal. Other than that, for spells here, I'd make sure to grab Fine Steed, because we're paladins, and a free warhorse that you can communicate with telepathically and fight as a seamless unit with is awesome. And yeah, I will be assuming that we're going to be getting an attack per round from our newly found steed when I crunch the numbers, though I appreciate that might not always be the case at your table. I don't want to get into whether or not that would work. Rules as written, feel free to check out the debate we had about it here many moons ago if you would really like to go down that rabbit hole. But please do make sure that your warhorse looks appropriately evil. Probably like a mane of fire and like fire coming off its hooves, right? No shimmering white stallions here, thank you very much. Though, actually, that might be kind of hilarious. <laughs> like, you cast the spell and this thing shows up and you're like, ugh, seriously? I ordered the black one. You are really cramping my style, Whitey. I'd also pick up aid for some really nice additional hit points for three of your party members and lesser restoration for a great little cure lots of crappy conditions spell. All right, at level six, it's time for our first damage report. So let's discuss what we're doing in combat. On round one, I'm gonna assume that you're casting hex with your bonus action and then just making weapon attacks. After that, it's just three attacks per turn, one with the blunt end of your spear as a bonus action, right? If you crit, I'm gonna assume that you're gonna smite with a second level spell slot, though we only have two of those at the moment. And I will assume that your warhorse is getting a single 2d6 plus four hooves attack as well. Not trampling charge though, because that just felt a little greedy. Now, here's the reality. You and your party will almost assuredly be better off with you concentrating on Bless than if you just selfishly used it for Hex. Especially because you will be using a bonus action to transfer Hex every so often, right? I don't know what enemies you're fighting. I don't know how fast they're dying. I don't know what allies you have in your party and how much they will benefit from Bless. So if I just crunch numbers for you and only you in a vacuum on a round where you're getting three attacks, Hex comes out on top. So. I'm gonna use Hex. Just know that, again, 
probably more often than not, you're gonna wanna go bless, unless someone else in the party is already doing so, right? But again, assuming Hex and all of the other things that I've talked about, we would be doing 1d4 plus 7d6 plus 22 damage in a round if everything landed, and thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 46 damage per round. And against an enemy with a 15 armor class, it would be 34 DPR. And you guys, that's really pretty good. I'm gonna call it like bottom half of tier one compared to other sustained damage builds that I've done at this level. And in case you don't know, check the video description to see spreadsheets and graphs, comparing everything, breaking down the numbers. And like, this is a sword and board character or a spear and board character, I suppose. And best of all, I mean, we're a paladin, so we can heal, we can buff, and assuming we've got plate mail armor right now, we're sitting at a 20 armor class without any magic items. Yeah, so far so good for that jack of all trades goal. Let's see where we can go from here. At level seven, we would be a paladin six and we get aura of protection. It just keeps getting better on this character. This is an amazing ability that makes everyone in your party love you and want to stand close to you, even if you are evil and reek of undeath. With R of Protection, you get to add your Charisma modifier to all saving throws for you and any ally within 10 feet. And this is one of the main reasons that we wanted to just be able to pump our Charisma score over everything else. And it's super awesome and powerful, and I love it madly. At level 8, we would be a Paladin 7, and we get Aura of Hate. And this... This is what sets the Oathbreaker apart as the premier sustained damage dealer of all paladins. Because with Aura of Hate, for you and any undead or fiends within 10 feet of you, all melee weapon damage rolls increase by, yep, your charisma modifier. And that is also fantastic and is the other main reason that we wanted to be sad about our charisma score. Now. Here's an interesting note. It doesn't say all friendly fiends and undead get this bonus, but that all fiends and undead within 10 feet. So yeah, if you're fighting against a horde of undead, I got some bad news for you. They're gonna hit a lot harder if they're closer to you. And you know what? I kind of love that. I imagine the sort of like strange frenzy that the evil beings of the world go into when they enter your aura, like they're feeding on your darkness and hatred somehow. They're drawn to you, but also inexplicably, they really want to kill you. And I can even imagine this leading to like some additional conflict between you and the other characters in your party, where they're again wondering like, whose side is this person really on? Why are you empowering our enemies? <laughs> Yeah, just a great opportunity for some good story and conflict there, I think. At level nine, we would be a Paladin eight and we get another ability score increase or feat. Naturally, we're going to bump our charisma, cap it at 20 here as it improves almost everything we do. Not just our defensive and support capabilities, but it's the best thing we can do for our damage as well. Happy days. For our level nine damage report then, we've picked up some really great bumps to our damage since last check. We've capped our charisma, meaning we not only have a better hit chance, but get a nice big bump to our damage thanks to our aura of hate. We've also picked up the amazing aura of protection, and I feel like this just might be the pinnacle of our Oathbreaker career. So against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 65 damage per round, and against an enemy with a 16 armor class, it would be 48 DPR. And just like last time, we're kind of comfortably in the bottom part of tier one compared to other sustained DPR builds at this level, but bringing a level of support and healing that's rivaled maybe only by our little brown nosing counterpart, that holy warrior, but we have better survivability than they do and way better eyeliner. At level 10, we would be a paladin nine and we get third level spells. Animate Dead and Bestow Curse come to us for free as Oathbreakers, and I want to talk about each of them. I'm admittedly not the world's biggest Animate Dead fan. It can kind of get into some problematic things similar to Conjure Animals, something I tried to exploit in that previously linked Necromancer Oathbreaker video. It is more exploitable as a Necromancer though, and so I have a much smaller reservation about using it as just an Oathbreaker. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time discussing the potential challenges of the spell. I did that in that other video, so go check that out if you wanna kinda of look at why it can be problematic in combat. But suffice to say that Walking around with a pet skeleton, or later a few pet skeletons, can present 
some challenges, both logistically on the battlefield as well as story-wise if you're walking through town, right? Be aware of these challenges and just make sure that you discuss with your party and with your DM on how you might try to deal with them. As for the mechanics of the spell itself, it can be marginally powerful. For us, you summon a skeleton or a zombie from a corpse. I'm assuming we're going to use skeletons as they do a little more damage, though they're arguably more fragile. And then for the next 24 hours, they obey you with a use of your bonus action. And I don't know why that bonus action can't just be stay by me and attack what I'm attacking that you just issue once at the beginning of a fight, or maybe even once when you first create them. But again, discuss with your DM. After 24 hours, you have to cast the spell again to reassert control, but the spell doesn't require concentration, which makes it quite nice. As a third level spell, it's not amazing. <laughs> One skeleton's only going to do a d6 plus two of damage, whether they're using their short bow option or their short sword option. And they only have a 13 armor class with 13 hit points. Of course, thanks to our Aura of Hate, our skellies do significantly more damage as undead. And the spell does scale pretty nicely, giving you two more skellies for every spell level that you upcast it. I will assume that you've got a skelly in your pocket when I crunch numbers from here on, and yeah, again, would generally advise to keep them 10 feet behind you using their short bows so that they can hopefully stay a little safer and be able to attack from range. Bestow Curse, the other free Oathbreaker spell here, might be worth using your concentration for once in a while, as it's a nice way to put a potentially strong debuff or a little more damage, I guess, on a single target, but the spell doesn't really shine, in my opinion, until you can upcast it as a fifth level spell, where it no longer requires concentration to use. As for the other third level spells I'd recommend here, there's lots of great support options, like Aura of Vitality, Revivify you should definitely consider, as well as Dispel Magic, always handy, but the two I would discuss for damage purposes here are Crusader's Mantle and Spirit Shroud. With Crusader's Mantle, you and every ally within 30 feet get an extra d4 of damage with their weapon attacks. Considering that we've got now a Warhorse and a Skeleton that would benefit from that, not to mention the rest of our party, of course, it's definitely worth considering using. That said, Spirit Shroud is going to look slightly better on the spreadsheet. Our hit chance is a lot better than our Skellies or our Warhorses, and Spirit Shroud does an extra d8 of damage to all of our own attacks for one minute without the need to transfer it from target to target with a bonus action like Hex. Spirit Shroud also has the added benefits of slowing your enemies down that are, if they're within 10 feet of you, letting you choose a damage type that the extra damage does between Cold, Necrotic, or Radiant, and even preventing an enemy that you hit with this extra damage from regaining hit points until the next round. And despite all of that, you still might be better off with Bless especially if you upcast it. And you also might be better off with Crusader's Mantle if you consider your entire party. But again, I'm just going to use Spirit Shroud here for number crunching as I'm only considering our character. Know your options and make the better choice in game, yeah. At level 11, we would be a Paladin 10, and that means we get Aura of Courage, which tells us that you and your allies within 10 feet can't be frightened while you're conscious. So now you can both cause fear in your enemies thanks to your channel divinity and simultaneously make you and your nearby allies immune to fear from outside sources. You are like the total fear master right now. That's awesome. At level 12, we would be a Paladin 11 and we get Improved Divine Smite, yet another amazing sustained DPR that all Paladins get, letting us add a D8 of radiant damage to each of our melee weapon attacks. Free damage is happiness. At level 13, we'd be a Paladin 12, and we get another ability score increase or feat. With our Charisma score capped, I think I would either look to take Warcaster if you really want to be casting spells with your hands full, and in that case, maybe you should have taken that sooner, right, and not be capping Charisma until now, or be looking to shore up your defenses here with maybe Resilient Constitution to give us proficiency in our Constitution saving throws and thus concentration checks. Though with Aura of Protection, that's a a little less important than it would be for the non-paladins of the world. You might instead just want to take tough for more hit points or bump your constitution score to kind of split the difference. Sentinel could be fun to give you reaction attacks against enemies who attack an ally, including your skelly bones or your evil warhorse, right? Not to mention being able to stop an enemy in their tracks when you hit them with an opportunity attack. Anyway, I'm just going to say Pick your favorite here, but there's lots of good options. For our level 13 damage report, the big increases to our damage since last check have come in the form of a cute little skelly friend, subbing out the superior spirit shroud for hex, and improved divine smite. 
but don't forget the fantastic defensive and support improvements we've picked up along the way, however. Anyway, against an enemy with a 10 armor class here, we would do on average 90 damage per round. And against an enemy with a 17 armor class, it would be 65 DPR. And yeah, same as always, we're kind of hanging out in the bottom of tier one, though admittedly, as the enemy AC increases, we're more like in the top half of tier two, since we don't really have a reliable source of advantage, like so many other sustained damage builds. And while not a ton of our damage is coming from our horse and our skelly, we are getting some there, and their hit chance is significantly lower than ours. So again, as the enemy AC increases, those allies are being significantly less effective, right? Still, we are doing super solid damage. We continue to just be a bastion and a bulwark of bombacious badassery and buffing <laughs> and other B words. Coming down the home stretch at level 14, we would be a paladin 13, and that means we get fourth level spells. Both breakers get blight for free, which is a decent single target burst damage spell, actually, and also confusion, which is an okay area of effect control spell. So now we get to add those things to the list of things that we can do fantastic. And then again, of course, there are some really decent support options in Auras of Life and Purity, as well as Death Ward, of course. Banishment is a really strong single target control spell. But the only one that I'm going to discuss for damage purposes here is Find Greater Steed. So yes, it's time to say goodbye to our evil or perhaps ironically pure warhorse and instead summon a griffin or a saber toothed tiger or a rhinoceros. I love it. I'm gonna take the griffin, of course, as, I mean, it's a flying mount for one, and it tends to do better damage than the other options here, unless you're against really high enemy armor classes and or the rhino has room to charge every single round. What does an evil griffin look like? You know what? It might not even matter, because guess what we're doing next level? We are starting our redemption arc. That's right. Level 15, we're getting out of Oathbreaker Paladin. I wanted to stay there until both 4th level spell slots and especially the Find Greater Steed, because it's just so good and cool. But if we are still playing our character this late in the game, I think it might be time for a switch. Stick with Pally if you want to, of course, there's great stuff ahead including bigger auras, 5th level spells eventually, resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage for Oathbreakers, cleansing touch, some good goodies. But the thing is, if we're trying to build for sustained DPR, and I am, in addition to being a jack of all trades, there are two main ways to increase our sustained DPR from here. The first would be to just bite the bullet and go for Great Weapon Master with a polearm. We'd need at least two more levels in Warlock to make it work, as we discussed earlier. It's not a terrible idea, and I wouldn't fault you for doing it. That said, without a known, consistent way to get advantage on this character, going the Great Weapon Master route with that minus five to hit penalty is just a lot less appealing to me, since I mean, even like at a 17 or 18 armor class, I think you'd be turning off that Great Weapon Master feature, again, without reliable advantage. And at this level, higher enemy ACs are almost the only thing that you're going to see, right? Of course, we still could go like the Darkness Devil Sight route, but I don't really want to. So yeah, don't love this option. The other way to improve our DPR is via higher level spell slots. Being able to upcast Spirit Shroud and Animate Dead as high as possible will do nice things for our DPR. Unfortunately, if we just stick with Paladin, we're not going to get to 5th level spell slots on this build by the time I stop it at level 17. As a half caster, our spell slot progression is just super slow. And since we dumped Intelligence and Wisdom, this means that if we wanted a full caster option, we've got Sorcerer and Bard. And either are fine options really, I think, but for me, the one I really want, especially for story purposes, is Sorcerer, because as a Sorcerer, at level 1. We get our Sorcerer subclass, our Sorceress origin, and that means we get to go Divine Soul. That's right, like I said, it's redemption time. See, Divine Soul Sorcerers are kinda like clerics, but like with better blasting capabilities. Light Cleric says, hold my beer. So yes, I want this to be a huge moment in my character's story arc here. What happened to change your heart or mind? An encounter with a divine being who 
saw a spark of good in you and decided to imbue you with some sort of heavenly blessing? Did you pass through some sort of trial where you were forced to choose between additional power or those you had come to respect and care for or maybe love? Perhaps inspired by the deity that you had originally sworn an oath to? You've now made the better choice and found redemption? After all, I don't know, but I can't wait to hear the story. Whatever your reasons, yeah, we're taking Divine Soul Sorcerer here to finish out our career. And as such, we get the Divine Magic feature, which essentially gives us access to both the Sorcerer and the Cleric spell lists, which means we can pick up things like Guidance and Healing Word to make us even better support characters than we already were. In addition, we get the really nice Favored by the Gods feature, which lets us add 2d4 to a missed attack or failed save once per short rest, and that is super clutch when we need it, whether offensively or defensively. I love this feature. At level 16, we would be a Sorcerer too, and we get Font of Magic. These are our sorcery points. We get one sorcery point per level of Sorcerer, and for now we can only use them to create additional spell slots, which is not a bad use of them. But then at level 17, finally, for us, we'd be a Sorcerer 3, and that means we get Meta Magic. And so yeah, we can pick two Meta Magic options that we can use those sorcery points on to enhance our spells in a variety of ways. I'm just gonna say pick your favorite here for Meta Magic. Nothing I'm gonna say that we have to have for sustained DPR purposes. It would definitely be nice to like quicken spell bless or crusader's mantle casting it as a bonus action instead of an action on our turn and then still being able to make a couple of weapon attacks in the same round right but anyway meta magic is awesome pick your favorites sticking with that theme we get second level sorcerer spells here and again nothing i would say we have to have to use in combat for damage so pick your favorites but you might want to consider spider climb tasha's mind whip vortex warp warding bond web lots of good choices for control utility and support just making us that much more well-rounded than ever and then yes thanks to how multi-classing with spell caster classes works we would now have a fifth level spell slot so we can upcast spirit shroud giving us 2d8 of damage per hit alternatively we could use it to upcast animate dead but two more skellies is going to do less for us than another d8 per attack of our own and of course you might decide to concentrate on something like bless or crusader's mantle or even bane or something else but for number crunching purposes i'm going with spirit shroud and that brings us to our final damage report at level 17. since last check we've added another d8 of damage per attack thanks to upcast spirit shroud we've got three skeleton companions now if we cast animate dead with a fourth level spell we can smite for 5d8 if we need to on a crit or otherwise of course but I'm just calculating it for critical hits. And we even get to ride on the back of a flying glorious griffin, all while bringing boatloads of burst damage options, support and buffing and utility, and even some control options with fantastic survivability. When I said earlier that we we're at the pinnacle of our character's career, I lied. But against an enemy with a 10 armor class here, we would now do 128 damage per round on average. And against an enemy with an 18 armor class, it would be 86 DPR. We've broken the centennial barrier and are at this level kind of in the upper half of tier two compared to other sustained DPR builds. And considering everything else that we are bringing to the table, that's kind of amazing. All right, final thoughts. Our tier score, if we take all of the damage that we do at each of the armor classes that we calculate for at each of the damage reports that we report on and just average them all together is a 55, putting them just barely ahead of the Eldritch Blade Master and right below the Crit Fisher, near the top of tier two. And I mean, you guys already know what I'm gonna say here, right? Like to do this level of sustained DPR while simultaneously bringing everything else that this character brings to the table from support to utility to defensive capabilities to control not to mention really really potent burst damage between Hexblade's Curse and Divine Smite Jack of all trades mission accomplished this character is just so godly or well I suppose ungodly for most of our career anyway but in an insanely powerful like a good at everything kind of way it's as though the worst paladin of all is kind of the best paladin of all <laughs> they would be so much fun to play and you would be so good at so many things that i have to believe that all of your other party members are going to just covet their neighbor in you <laughs> 
That's right, you dastardly villain. Encourage your friends to break those commandments. Anyway, that's the build for the week. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed putting it together. I had a lot of fun with this one. More importantly though, I hope you know how much I love you because I do. You're awesome. Thank you for watching and doing all of the things that you do to support me and this channel. I hope you'll check out the other content in the channel if you're not in the habit of doing so. But above all, I hope that you stay safe and that you be good and kind and happy and that I get to see you again very, very soon. But until then, take care. Okay, hmm, this is about the, the evilest t-shirt I own, I suppose, cracking a joke about Mordor, the Mordor fun run, sign up now. I'm sorry, but I'm just thinking of the right words to say, I know they don't sound the way I plan them to be, but if I had to walk the world, I'd make you fall for me, I promise you, I promise you I will. I will. <laughs> I will, I will, I will, I will. <laughs> Today on One Hit Wonders from the 80s, When in Rome, The Promise. It's too bad our Oathbreaker couldn't keep his promises, am I right? Right? <whistles> ah, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. That's my Matthew McConaughey impersonation. It's so good. Yeah, right, so... <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> Fly. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> Don't say that. Do say that. <laughs> as for the mechanics of the spell itself... Itself? Of the spell... As for the mechanic... <sighs> okay. We get two sorcery points per level of... We get two source... We get one sorcery point per level of sorcerer. Hi. <laughs> uh, sometimes you just aren't quite sure how to open a show.